What's all the buzz about Beijing's hypersonic weapons, and why could they pose a nuclear threat to the U.S.? We break it down in today's episode. A 12-year-old girl died after getting a shot of a Chinese-made vaccine. Her mother asked authorities for an investigation into the case, only to be beaten and detained. Chinese journalists must undergo so-called continuous education by the state, at least 90 hours every year. That's to learn how to develop news with a Marxism angle. China's real-life version of the U.S. crime drama Prison Break. Footage of an agile North Korean's jailbreak in China is going viral. And Taiwanese businesses are leaving China. And experts say a bigger wave of retreat is on the way. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. China news may seem chaotic. With so much information swirling in the news, we want to offer you a look at the bigger picture to help you make sense of the details. If you haven't already, use the link in the description box and subscribe to our China In Focus newsletter. On top of offering the highlights of what's going on, it also gives the much-needed context behind those stories. And once in a while, you'll also get a peek into some behind-the-scenes content to see what we're up to. Every Friday morning, the latest will land in your inbox. Provinces across China are mass testing residents again. That's after members of a tour group tested positive for the CCP virus. According to a major Chinese media outlet, at least 10 provinces are involved. A couple in the group first tested positive, and then all members of the group later tested positive. Authorities made their travel routes public, and local officials along the routes started mass testing. They are asking people to report themselves if there's a chance they could have made contact with the group. According to Chinese media, the tourist attractions they visited are temporarily closed. Schools and some public services and businesses are also closed. The testing has so far found more than 40 positive cases, some of them in a suburban district of Beijing, though NTD cannot independently verify these numbers. According to the Chinese CDC, the local CCP virus cases confirmed on Wednesday are almost double the number from the day before. The U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee says it's not in their place to remark on a country's rules and regulations, nor the treatment of its people. The comment comes the same day the Olympic flame is handed over to China. NTD's Don Ma reports. And over 200 athletes from around the world gathered in Beijing to take part in an Olympic qualifying event. The chair of the USOPC says it's not in their place to talk about rights concerns. And that is, you know, we really have no opportunity since we are not a government to influence the activities of another country's um, rules and, and regulations and treatment of people within their own country. We expect that uh, that China is going to be a unique situation to you know, really allow sport to speak for unity and for uh, for global peace and for the rights of people around the world. That really is. The and in Greece on Monday, the Olympic flame was lit at the ancient site of Olympia. The event was briefly interrupted by rights activists holding a banner that read no genocide games. This is after protesters on Sunday climbed onto scaffolding in front of Greece's Propylaea temple holding a Tibetan flag and a sign reading free Hong Kong revolution before being detained by police and security guards. Don Ma, NTD News. Beijing officials have issued new regulations and guidelines on China's news industry. The regulations shed light on the kind of news that's being produced in communist China. The document says certified Chinese journalists must undergo so-called continuous education by the state at least 90 hours every year. Article 3 of the regulation says the continuing education of news professionals and technical personnel must adhere to the guidance of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics. Xi Jinping thought is a set of policies and ideas derived from the writings and speeches of Chinese leader Xi Jinping. And it mostly comes from a speech he gave in 2013, where he praised Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong and socialism. Article 4 of the regulation states that continuing education work must engage in in-depth education of developing news with a Marxist angle. It also says the continuing education must closely follow the CCP's mission in news and public opinion work. A senior Chinese media professional living in Germany with a career in Chinese media for more than 20 years told news outlet Radio Free Asia that Chinese reporters dare not report the truth. They're merely reporting the CCP's propaganda. 
China has big ambitions to launch the world's first digital currency. A digital version of the Chinese yuan will give Beijing detailed data over every single transaction made using this type of currency. The regime has been wanting to expand its use among foreigners, and it sees the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics as a great chance to do so. Now, the Financial Times reports that Chinese authorities are pressuring one of the Olympics' biggest sponsors, McDonald's, to allow digital yuan payments at its restaurants. McDonald's declined to tell the Financial Times whether it's under pressure. The outlet says other American companies, like Nike and financial services giant Visa, are under similar pressure. The two companies didn't comment on the issue. China's real-life version of the U.S. crime drama Prison Break, a North Korean defector kept in a Chinese jail cell, managed to escape on Monday. Footage of his jailbreak is going viral on Chinese social media. The wanted man is called Zhu Xianjian. The surveillance camera captured him scaling a shed barefoot and running across the roof. He then used a rope-like object to damage the prison's electric fence, climb over the high wall, and sprint away before vanishing from sight. Authorities in China are hunting him down. The bounty for his arrest is over $20,000. He was smuggled into China in 2013 and was later sentenced to 11 years in prison for illegal border crossing, larceny and robbery. Some Chinese netizens say based on his agility, they suspect he could be a member of the special forces. A girl from central China's Henan province died after getting a Chinese-made COVID-19 vaccine. Her mother was then beaten and detained after asking local authorities to look into her daughter's death and seeking justice in Beijing. Zhang Yanhong is a single mother from Henan province. She told the Epoch Times that her 12-year-old daughter, Li Boyi, got a Chinese-made COVID-19 vaccine in mid-August. Two days later, the child started suffering from a high fever and a dozen complications and died at the end of August. The mother had reportedly updated her Chinese social media account every day since late September, documenting the number of days it's passed since her daughter died. Zhang went to local authorities asking for an investigation into the case, but nobody wanted to talk with her. Then she went to her county's health commission, but a group of men there pushed her to the ground and beat her for about 40 minutes. She uploaded the video of the assault to Chinese social media site Weibo. Then her account got blocked, and she couldn't update any information. According to a Chinese website report, Zheng has been detained since mid-October. That's after she went to Beijing to petition for the case. Authorities charged her with provoking trouble. Even her sister, who went to Beijing with her, was detained. For many years, families of vaccine victims in China have been defending their rights and seeking justice. Yang Wenjun is one of them. Her son got a Chinese-made DPT vaccine in 2008 when he was three months old. Then he had serious allergic reactions and became mute. Even now, he can't take care of himself. Yang says she was detained for seven days for defending her son's rights. I was detained for the so-called crime of provoking troubles. I hung a banner on the window of my home. They arrested me on the same day and detained me for seven days. The police told me viciously that if I do it again, they would double the punishment. The police in China have become gangsters. An observer of vaccine incidents from Hunan province says that by detaining family members who petition for the vaccine victims, authorities want to set an example for other rights defenders. Vaccine accidents are getting more frequent. If authorities don't suppress this problem, they are afraid it will become more troublesome when victims follow it up, claim compensation, or request to hold them accountable, so they don't dare to admit their mistakes. They want to punish the rights defenders as an example to intimidate other victims. For years, Chinese vaccines have been involved in scandals due to quality issues. Many countries now don't recognize Chinese vaccines for their vaccine mandates over quality issues. A Chinese community in Italy is appealing to authorities to change the rules for the country's mandatory COVID-19 health pass scheme, which doesn't recognize the Chinese vaccine. The Green Pass mandatory in Italian workplaces from October 15th. But many among the 50,000-strong Chinese community in the city of Prado received the Sinovac vaccine in China, which doesn't qualify for the Green Pass.
The head of Prado's Chinese community, which grew up around the local textile industry, has written to the authorities asking to change the rule. But the only vaccines currently recognized by Italy for the purposes of the Green Pass are Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. And Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi has personally expressed skepticism about Sinovac, saying it has shown itself not to be adequate. Now we look at a nuclear threat facing the U.S. and how it relates to China's hypersonic weapons. It all started with a story from news outlet Financial Times. Citing unnamed sources, the outlet says Beijing tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile. And even though Beijing denies the test, the news is making a splash and still picking up steam. And what makes a hypersonic missile concerning? In short, Beijing can use it to launch a nuclear strike against the U.S., and it'd be hard for America's defense system to track it. A U.S. arms control official says we just don't know how we can defend against that technology. Neither does China, neither does Russia. So what are hypersonic missiles? To put it simply, they are missiles that can travel at least five times faster than sound. And there are two types of them. One is called hypersonic cruise missile. The other is called hypersonic glide vehicle or HGV. And the one that Beijing reportedly tested is an HGV. It's more expensive and harder to build, but it's faster and more suitable for a sneak attack. Right now, America's defense systems are mainly designed to intercept traditional ballistic missiles. They follow a predictable arc, so it's easy for radar to detect them and shoot them down. But HGVs are a different story. They fly much lower and can maneuver before hitting a target, making them much harder to track. By the time a radar can detect them, it might already be too late to react. The U.S. does have a kind of defense system that can deal with HGV strikes. But some argue they can only defend small areas, not enough to cover the continental USA. So right now, who has HGVs? China and Russia. And China has tested its HGVs at least nine times since 2014. But Beijing keeps a low profile and hasn't released any information on their accuracy. The U.S. is developing its own HGV projects, but they are still in the prototype period. Other nations like Japan and Australia are also investing in their own research. The U.S. arms control official says the U.S. has held back from pursuing this technology. But seeing that China and Russia are actively militarizing it, the U.S. has to respond in kind. A member of the U.S. Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, is calling for more restrictions on a Chinese drone maker, citing national security risks. Commissioner Brendan Carr said on Tuesday the FCC should add Chinese company DJI to a blacklist that would prevent U.S. federal money from being used to buy its equipment. DJI is the world's largest drone maker, and more than half of the drones sold in the U.S. are from this company. The company says its drones are safe for a wide range of using, including sensitive industrial and government work. But in a statement, Carr compares it with another Chinese company, Huawei. DJI drones are collecting vast troves of sensitive data on Americans and U.S. critical infrastructure, potentially operating as a Huawei on wings. Back in December, the U.S. Commerce Department added DJI to an economic blacklist. At the beginning of last year, the Interior Department said it was grounding its fleet of about 800 Chinese-made drones. That's after the department had first halted buying such drones. And in May 2019, the Department of Homeland Security warned U.S. firms about the risks that Chinese drones pose to company data. As to the FCC, this is not the first time the regulator takes aim at Chinese companies. Earlier this year, the FCC designated five Chinese telecom equipment companies as posing a threat to national security. The companies are Huawei, ZTE, Hytera, Hanzhou Hikvision and Zhejiang Dahua. Now we turn to tensions in the South China Sea. On Tuesday, a U.S. Senate committee passed a new bill. It aims to counter China's expansive maritime claims in the South and East China Seas. The bill would impose sanctions on Chinese officials and entities that help Beijing assert territorial claims in the two seas. For example, through island building or military aggression. They will be denied U.S. visa and their U.S. properties will be frozen. Also, U.S. entities won't be allowed to do business with them. China claims most of the South China Sea, despite an international court ruling against its claims. A number of neighboring countries also dispute Beijing's claims. In August, Beijing said its sovereignty over every island in the South China Sea is indisputable. 
That's shortly after U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris called the claims unlawful. We're going to speak up. We're going to speak up when there are actions that Beijing takes that threaten the rules-based international order, again, such as activity in the South China Sea. In the East China Sea, Chinese Coast Guard vessels have patrolled the waters around a group of islands controlled by Japan. Beijing claims the uninhabited islets as part of its territory. Taiwanese businesses have been operating in China for decades, but now some experts say the time has come for them to leave. In total, Taiwanese firms have pulled nearly half of their investments out of China in the last 10 years. But it looks like a bigger wave of retreat is on the way. Taiwan expert Lin Tung Hong says Taiwanese businesses in China have entered a phase of decline. Lin is a research fellow from the Institute of Social Sciences of the Academia Sinica in Taiwan. In a recent seminar, he explained the three stages for Taiwanese companies operating in China. He calls the first phase gold coding, but points out that the influx of foreign capital did not make China more democratic. The second phase he calls the big surge. That's when China's economy was soaring, but the business environment was growing less favorable. Lin highlights the fast-growing labor costs in China. Taiwan-based China affairs expert She Chin Ho agrees with Lin. He gives an example of a classmate now doing business in China and explains that Chinese workers would rather do delivery jobs than working in factories. I have a classmate who's the original equipment manufacturer for Louis Vuitton. He said he had 4,300 workers at the peak. Now only 43 are left. I wondered why and asked him if he gave them a pay raise. He said the salary has been raised to more than 7,500 Chinese yuan, or around 1,200 U.S. dollars. Shea mentions that in the 1990s, the salary for Chinese assembly line workers was around 350 Chinese yuan, or around $55 a month. Now the salary is nearly $1,200. Lin says years after the big surge, Chinese leader Xi Jinping's policy changes ushered in the third phase, which he calls the phase of decline. Lin lists many unfavorable conditions, including higher taxes, less land, fewer preferential policies, and more domestic competition. He says that's why many Taiwanese businesses are leaving. She expressed similar concerns in a recent interview. He also mentions China's recent power crunch. So I believe the power crunch is a red flag for Taiwan businesses. It means relocating the production line is inevitable. She predicts that the power crunch may last longer. Considering how many Taiwan businesses operate in China, that'll be a great challenge for those companies. She is also worried about Xi's policy of common prosperity. The policy, which aims to equalize wealth distribution, has forced China's wealthiest to donate a record sum. For example, this time the Association of Taiwan Investment Enterprises on the mainland has responded to the policy of common prosperity. If Taiwanese businesses donate the money they earn, then I'm sure they will face greater difficulties. So they need to be extra cautious now. Taiwanese businesses have been running in China for 30 years, but data shows that the percentage of Taiwanese investments in China has dropped by nearly half in the past decade. China's power shortage could be threatening the car industry with another shortage, magnesium. The element is a raw material used in the production of aluminum alloys, which is essential in the production of automobiles. Major North American aluminum maker Metalco Incorporated warned its customers in a statement that in the last several weeks, magnesium availability has dried up, saying if the scarcity continues, the company may need to curtail production in 2022. Magnesium is used to harden aluminum, which is then used to make gearboxes, steering columns, seat frames, and fuel tank covers in cars. China produces over 80 percent of the world's magnesium. And the current power rationing is limiting factories producing the element. Around mid-September, authorities in China's Sanxi province mandated an energy consumption limit on all magnesium smelters in Yulan City, ordering them to reduce output by 50 percent. The city accounts for around 60 percent of China's magnesium output. And it's not just affecting North America. Germany's Association of Metals Producers, WMV, said in a statement, it is expected that the current magnesium reserves in Germany and throughout Europe will be exhausted by the end of November. 
Many car makers are kept alive by the Chinese market. Brands like Buick, Volkswagen and Cadillac are seeing more sales in China than in their home countries. For U.S. car brand Buick, China is their biggest market by far. Approximately 80 percent of their total sales are to the Chinese market. In 2020, Buick sold close to a million vehicles in China. By comparison, in the U.S., they sold a mere 162,000 vehicles in the same year. Similarly, China is also German brand Volkswagen's most important market. Sales to China accounted for more than 50 percent of the brand's global sales in 2020. That's nearly 3 million units. Compared to Europe's sales, about 1.4 million units. This is also the case for U.S. car brand Cadillac. China is the brand's biggest global market by volume sold, a much bigger market compared to the U.S. The Chinese market is arguably key to survival for all these brands. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.